Our second scripture reading for today is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. And it's um, Ezekiel's not a book that most of us have spent a lot of time reading, but if you recognize anything from Ezekiel, it'll be this. It is uh, his vision of the valley of the dry bones. And I invite you now to listen to God's word. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, Oh, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open up your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I will place you on your own soil. And then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will act, says the Lord. People of God, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Like I said, the book of Ezekiel is probably not the most well-known in Scripture. Certainly not for Christians. We don't spend a lot of time here. I confess that I have not spent a lot of time reading the book of Ezekiel. But it is a fascinating look at the life of one of God's prophets. Ezekiel was a prophet from the 6th century BC, which means that his historical context was the Babylonian exile. For generations after the Exodus, Israel had lived in the promised land under the leaders that God gave them, uh, under the Davidic, Davidic line, and, and things were good for a long time, but then the nation split following Solomon, and Israel was in the north, Judah was in the south, and over time, things got progressively worse. Over time, their sin became worse and worse. They began worshiping foreign idols. They began adopting religious practices from the surrounding peoples. They forgot about Yahweh, who had led them out of Egypt into freedom in the promised land. So in time... Yahweh allowed all these other nations surrounding them to conquer them, allowed these nations to bring judgment against his people. First it was Assyria in the north, then it was Babylon in the south, and in the end both Israel and Judah were defeated, were conquered, their cities destroyed, their temple lay in ruins, and the people who were not killed in these invasions were taken away into slavery. It was among this broken and desperate group of people that Ezekiel lived and worked. Much of his prophecy involves really vivid imagery of Yahweh's judgment on Israel for its unfaithfulness. Uh, like I said, these writings are not familiar 
to us, but if we have hurt them, we remember them because they are so strange, so odd, so vibrant. Ezekiel is a guy who has wild visions, who eats scrolls, who shaves his head with a sword, and then divides up the hair into portions and burns it in a ritual. He, he builds scale models and armies, and, and he smashes them together. And he spends over a year lying on his side as an object lesson about the judgment of God on Israel. Zeke might not have been entirely right in the head, okay? <laughs> but his prophecies and his parables that spanned over a decade were powerful messages that both explained the suffering of the Hebrew nation and offered Yahweh's promises of a coming restoration to them. If we do know anything about Ezekiel or about his prophecies, like I said, we're probably familiar with this one chapter, this vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones. In a book full of incredible stories and proclamations, this one stands out. Because, you know, Hebrew narratives are, are characteristically light on detail. They're, they're very matter-of-fact, they're very brief, sparse. But here we get a picture that we have no trouble imagining. Here we have a mass graveyard, as far as the eye can see. Sun-bleached skeletons covering the parched and dusty landscape. Death so old that the bones have long since been picked clean. There aren't even any scavengers active here. Everything is silent. Everything is dead. Reminds me of the, uh, the, the elephant graveyard in The Lion King, that scene. This land is spooky. It is oppressively quiet. But not for long. God arrives with this prophet Ezekiel, and he asks an absurd question. Mortal, can these bones live? And the prophet gives a tactful non-answer. It's up to you, Lord. It's up to you. So God says, let's get to work. We're going to bring them back to life, and here's what I need you to do. And he explains everything that Ezekiel needs to say. And so Ezekiel reports, I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, there was a rattling, and the bones started coming together, bone to its bone. And now we've gone from the Lion King to some kind of horror film. This is, this is Halloween uh, on steroids. And, and, and the bodies are, are being reanimated as we watch. The skeletons are rumbling and coming back together. The, the, the skin, the sinews, the flesh, the muscles are being re-knit onto the bones. They're not fully alive at this point. There's a, a valley full of corpses now. And Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the breath, to the spirit, and command that breath to come back into the bodies. And once he does, then they stand up and they live, and they walk. And then God delivers the punchline. These bones are the house of Israel who have been crying out in their exile that they are defeated, that they are lost, they are hopeless, they are beyond salvation. Remember what's really going on here. In exile, Israel had been obliterated as a nation. It surely seemed to them that Yahweh had abandoned them. It surely seemed that their story was over. They had become this, this figurative valley of dry bones. There was no life left in them, and they were certain that they would be slaves until the day that the last one of them died, and then they would be a forgotten footnote in history. And instead, Yahweh speaks, commands the prophet to prophesy, and things change. Suddenly, instead of a vision of, of Israel's despair and death, there is a vision of new life. 
As Ezekiel follows Yahweh's commands, the bones come together, bone to its bone. Muscle and tissue lay over the bones and skin covers them. And then Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the breath and life fills the bodies and they stand up on their feet. And suddenly this scene looks a lot more like a beginning than like an ending. It's hard to miss the creation imagery that's at use here in this vision. It's so obviously reminiscent of Genesis. We heard the phrase, bone came together, bone to its bone. And that ought to remind us of something that's said in Genesis 2. This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, says Adam when he sees Eve, when the first man is introduced to the first woman. And that phrase brings us back to that idyllic scene in the garden where God had created everything good and life without death was all that we were aware of. It stands in stark contrast to the opening of Ezekiel's vision where this valley is full of death, death without life. And this is the point of his message, a message of hope in desperate times, a message of life in the face of death, a message of recreation for Israel that is in mourning. One of the things I love in this vision that is much more apparent in the Hebrew is the blurred line between Yahweh's spirit and the breath of life. In Hebrew, it's all the same word, ruach. Ruach. That word is used over a dozen times in this chapter. And it's alternately translated as spirit or breath or wind. It, it means all of these things, and it again deliberately points us back to Genesis, back to the beginning. Because in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters before creation. The Ruach of God hovered over the waters. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind, a ruach, from God swept over the face of the waters. And then in Genesis 2, Yahweh formed the first human being from lifeless earth, Adama, and breathed life into Adam through his spirit. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So we see from the very beginning this picture of what it means to be human, spirit and body together. Ruach and Adama together is what makes a human being alive. As I said with the children earlier, only living things breathe and only breathing things live. It's necessary for us to breathe to be alive. Notice the bones at first are restored to the appearance of living beings. They get all the, all the stuff put back on them and in them, and, and they look like bodies again, but they're not alive yet. They're missing that essential thing. They're missing breath. They need to have the Ruach of God, the Spirit of God in them. And therefore, Yahweh continues and instructs Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath. Ezekiel prophesies, and the wind comes from the four corners of the earth and fills the bodies, and finally they stand and breathe and live. And Yahweh says, You shall know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and bring you out of your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. I will place you back on your own soil. This is the fullness of God's promise. Israel is going to have not just life again, but life as the people of Yahweh filled with God's spirit. He will be their God. They will be his people. They won't just be a nation. They will be the nation of the Lord, the nation of Yahweh. And this is reflected again remarkably in the Pentecost story that we heard from Acts 2. The early church, if, if they could even be called the church yet, is at this point hiding out in fear. They're in Jerusalem, and Jesus, their, their close friend, their teacher, has been executed. And he's been raised from the dead, and he has ascended into heaven. And can you imagine how confusing that would be? 
here's this person that you've devoted your life to, and all of a sudden he's gone. And all of a sudden he's back. And all of a sudden he's gone again. And meanwhile, all he has told you is, wait. Wait. When I go, wait in Jerusalem for the gift of God's Spirit that I'm going to send to you. And the people had no idea how long that would take. They had no idea what it would look like when it came. What are they supposed to do? What are they supposed to do? Yeah, they know they're supposed to go and teach people what Jesus taught them. They know they're supposed to share the truth they know about his death and resurrection. But at the same time, there are still people out there who are very angry at them, who are looking to kill them, to put an end to this movement that Jesus started. It was a strange time, and, and Jesus' followers were left in a strange situation with a lot of unanswered questions. Where do we go? How do we live now that Jesus is not with us? So there they are waiting, and I imagine it probably felt very much like a spiritual valley of dry bones, a valley of the shadow of death. And suddenly, history repeated itself. Suddenly, a strong wind rushed in among them and breathed new life into them. God had chosen to reveal himself to the disciples in a new and different way, going beyond the written word, going beyond even the incarnate word who they knew in Jesus. God now sends his spirit to indwell them. And, and much like the dry bones, they are filled again with life as God's spirit comes into them. He is their God, they are his people, and they're able to go out and begin preaching and proclaiming what God has done, all in, in new languages, in different tongues that they've never spoken before, as the Spirit gives them ability. Peter is able to stand up to the, to the criticism of the crowds and to say that this outpouring of the Spirit is God's doing for the glorification and for the building of God's kingdom. And it's characteristic of the new time that they are in. God is pouring out his spirit on all people, giving them new power, new ability, new life. Now the same spirit that raised the dry bones to new life is the same spirit that came upon the disciples, bringing them to new life, and the same spirit that is in the church today, stirring us to new life. There is no disconnect between the ancient Israelites and the early Christian church and the church here and now. The people of Yahweh here in this time and place. There was no age of the Spirit back then that is somehow absent from us now. It might sometimes seem like it to us, but she is still here. The question is, are we still attuned to the work of the Spirit in our lives, in our church? I think this question is especially relevant for us now as we are coming out of the pandemic time. You know, I've read no shortage of articles about what is going to happen to the church after coronavirus. What's going to happen now that this threat is coming to an end? What are we going to do? What has all this change meant? Who are we going to be? What is church going to look like now? Will people come back? That's the question people really want answered. That's the question pastors are most worried about. Will people come back? That's the thing we want to know. People who have broken all their usual patterns, who have lost all this strength in their spiritual muscles, who have learned that maybe they like sleeping in on Sunday. Will they come back? to their old religious habits? And how can we get them to come back? Now, obviously, I'm not talking to anybody who's here. Y'all are back. I'm pleased to see you here. But we're all very worried about the rest of them, everybody who's not here. What are they doing? Will they come back and join us in doing this? And to that end, I've seen a lot of churches rushing out and, and trying to resume and restore their programs, put things back into place to reassert their familiar patterns of worship and ritual. And they're trying, I think, to force things to go back to normal as fast as they can. But you know what it makes me think of? 
a valley of dry bones. A year of disconnection and decay and despair, a valley of bones, and a prophet calling out to them to get up and live again. And what happens is the sinews and the muscles and the flesh all come back, and they look like they did before. Their bodies, but you know, anybody who's ever been to a funeral knows, to an open casket funeral especially, knows that a mortician can do amazing things and make a body look like it's just sleeping, like it's still alive. But we all know it's not. It's just a corpse. The body doesn't live unless God's spirit, God's breath, God's ruach is in it. And so here's where we are. Here's, here's what I think we need to figure out as a post-pandemic church. We died, in a way. We died, and now we're being knit back together. Our bones and our, our, our sinews and our flesh are coming back together. But are we really alive? Or are we a very convincing corpse with a comforting set of makeup? Let's not be satisfied with just looking alive, with just the appearance of life, with making everything look the way that it did before. Let's keep on prophesying. Let's keep on calling out for God's spirit to dwell within our body. Let's keep on begging for the spirit of God to stir us and to truly resurrect us, to make us alive and breathing and moving as Yahweh directs us in new ways. And for that to happen, we have to listen. We have to pay attention. We never know what God's Spirit is going to do next. In the Acts passage, the Spirit appears to people as a rushing wind and a violent image, uh, tongues of fire on their heads. This would have been hard to miss. Nobody would have had any question that God's Spirit was doing something. And sometimes the Spirit works that way in our lives. Sometimes it's undeniable and it's obvious that she's at work and moving in mighty and incredible ways. But in the Ezekiel passage, the Spirit of God comes on the bodies as a breath. I don't hear any of you breathing, but I know you are because you're alive. Sometimes God's spirit moves just like that, works just like that. It is subtle, hard to hear, but no less powerful. And so we need to be paying attention. We need to be attuned to the times that God chooses to move as breath, as wind, as a still, small voice. Let us listen, let us hear, let us receive the Spirit, let us breathe, and let us live. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.